Hello, everyone. Hello, hello, hello. Thank you. Um, I am pleased to announce, uh, introduce Joshua. He is a researcher at the Future of Humanity Institute in the Biosecurity Research Team. Um, his research interests include how to incentivize and facilitate the development of medical countermeasures, um, how to regulate and disseminate, or not, uh, potential dual use research, and how to convert insights from biosecurity research to actual policy change. Um, he holds an MSc in Public Health from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine and London School of Economics and Political Science. He also holds a BA in Ethics, Politics and Economics from Yale University. Give it up for Joshua. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming. Uh, I'm pleased to see so many of you would find time in what I know is a very busy weekend. Uh, I can imagine for some of you, this might be your very first Effective Altruism Conference, so in particular, or indeed, your very first conference at all. Uh, so very much welcome to you, uh, and uh, thanks for spending some of it here with us today. Uh, so my name mentioned, uh, my name is Joshua. I'm a researcher at the Future Manly Institute. Uh, I also work as a consultant with the biological risk team at the Nuclear Threat Initiative. But while my day-to-day -day work focuses on biosecurity, I would like to talk to you today on a different topic relating to what we could call effective altruism movement strategy. And my motivation for wanting to speak about this particular topic is that uh, I've been involved with this uh, movement or community for going on six years now. I think the effective altruism movement has done a lot of good for the world. And I'm very convinced it will continue to. At the same time, I have uh, what I think are some fairly serious concerns with the ability of the community to realize its full potential um, and some of the underlying reasons of which I will discuss today. So, I have three overarching goals for this talk. First, I will introduce this idea of rowing and steering, uh, which of course I will define in a moment, uh, as a framework for thinking about effective altruism movement strategy. Secondly, I'll present a, a case in favor of perhaps we should have more steering uh, than we currently do. And finally, I will highlight uh, critiquing effective altruism as one example of uh, an important activity that could be falling under the steering umbrella. Uh, perhaps one thing to note is that I, there's an accompanying forum post uh, on this topic wh where I have uh, just appended all the links that I refer to in this, discuss in this talk. So no need to scribble furiously. You can find everything online later if you are so interested. All right, so I should begin by giving credit where it's due. Uh, I'm very grateful to many people, including but not limited to those listed here for a lot of conversations around this topic. And also, uh, as some of you probably uh, picked up, the idea of rowing and steering is inspired by a post by Open Philanthropies, Open Konofsky, uh, which discusses in particular rowing and steering, but also uh, a broader framework for thinking about making the world better. So what exactly do I mean by rowing and steering? Well, let's begin by defining both of these terms. And I'll begin by explaining how uh, Holden Kanofsky, that is, used it as an approach to thinking about different approaches to making the world better. Here, rowing is efforts to get a ship to reach its destination faster. So if humanity is a ship, that could be efforts to promote economic growth or facilitate technological progress that Whatever the goals of humanity or society or civilization may be, we're in a better position to realize those goals. What I like to do is apply that concept a bit more narrowly and think specifically about the effective altruism movement and community. And here, a slightly different definition would be efforts to increase the power or perhaps influence of the effective altruism movement. So what might be examples of growing activities? Well, it could be outreach, it could be a conference like this one, in general, anything that has as its aim to A, bringing more people, and B, empower the people who are in the community who shares its goals to be more able to execute those goals. And if you're thinking about rowing, then failure looks in a certain way. Here, failure would probably look like not becoming influential enough fast enough. And this failure mode is especially salient if perhaps you think that some irreversible outcome is very imminent. 
such as an existential catastrophe, or if you think that you're acting with urgency uh, in the face of some particular window of opportunity, perhaps a policy window to enact change, then it is indeed the case that if you're not moving fast enough, you're not rowing fast enough, then you may encounter failure. By contrast, steering, Karnofsky defines as efforts to navigate to a better destination than the current one. So if we are not thinking just about the effects of altruism community, but just the world at large, steering might mean averting certain uh, icebergs, as it were, such as extensive catastrophes, or reflecting on what uh, ideal society looks like. And similarly, I think we can think about that in the context of the effects of altruism community. So here that would be improving the movement's aims, and also making sure that we are, in fact, executing on those aims as opposed to anything else. Efforts that uh, are perhaps within the category of steering and the effects of altruism movement would be something like the global priorities research or the cause prioritization research that many of our colleagues uh, work hard on. It could also be certain things within community building like improving the community's epistemic norms or its general health. And here, failure looks quite different from the previous failure mode. So here, failure is not about failing to grow or become influential, but failure is perhaps about wielding that influence in the wrong way, either because you set out the wrong goals or because you didn't have institutions in place that allowed you to move towards those goals specifically. I think this is best summarized uh, by one of my favorite lyrics by the American rapper and poet, J. Cole, who says, the good news is you came a long way, the bad news is you went the wrong way. <laughs> and my motivation for giving this talk is to hopefully uh, avoid this particular failure mode. So how do we do that? And why do you think this is important? Uh, so I present three arguments for um, why I think we need more steering than we perhaps currently are. This is not to say that there is no steering going on. As I mentioned, I think a lot of our colleagues and friends are working on things you could categorize as steering. Nor is it to say that rowing is not important. I do think that it is a good thing for the world that the effects of altruism has grown, and I hope it will continue to grow. Um, at the same time, I think that, at least from my vantage point, steering right now feels in some ways neglected. It is no longer the case that the effects of altruism movement is a small fringe academic or social movement. It is a very, I think, rapidly growing, particularly in terms of financial resources committed, but also in terms of political influence, both at the national and international stage. And so, with all this momentum, I think now is also the time to make sure that we're charting the right, the right course. In particular, if something is neglected, this is a line of reasoning that will be familiar to many of you, if something is neglected, there may be low-hanging fruit. Um, and so, this is why I think with all the momentum, all the people focusing on how do we bring in more effective altruists, how do we make sure that policymakers listen to effective altruists, it's really important that we also think about are the things we're feeding into those policymakers, in fact, the things we really want to be pushing for? And is the community we're building uh, made up in such a way that allows us to, to adjust course as we go along? I want to recognize that how neglected this feels probably depends on your vantage point. So I live here in Oxford. There's a lot of effective altruist-minded uh, people around me. Uh, I see a lot of the, the momentum you know, up front, and this is what gives me this feeling of great momentum, uh, which makes me think, okay, maybe we need more steering. Uh, but I also remember what it was like doing uh, community building at a university, which I did for three years during my undergraduate, uh, and talking to, you know, uh, endless numbers of people who just did not seem very interested in effective altruism. And there I very much felt like, I wish we could you know, row faster and get more people in. So I appreciate that your, your vantage point on the ship, so to speak, probably uh, influences how you feel about this. The second point is that steering early on is probably more tractable than later on. If you're charting a course from Europe to North America, uh, it's a lot better to adjust the direction of your ship by a few degrees early on than once you've traversed hundreds of thousands of miles and then now to need to make a very big detour to catch up for your uh, mistaken navigation. And similarly, if we're growing the community and we're giving people a certain impression of what is effective altruism, it's going to be a lot easier to tweak that uh, definition or that mindset early on than later on. I think one really salient example here is a 
idea of earning to give, which early in the movement, I think, in the movement's history, a uh, very young history, uh, there was a lot of very successful, we could call them rowing efforts to spread that idea. There was a lot of uh, wide-reaching uh, media appearances and articles pushing the idea of earning a lot of money to donate ch ch to charity, which, in, you know, in a sense, was a success. But it also has meant that now, as a thinking around earning to give has changed, and some of the circumstances around the effective altruism community have changed such that perhaps it's a bit more nuanced whether this is what effective altruism is, it's hard to update that because the idea is sort of, you know, has left the, uh, the horse has left the stables, um, and it's easier to adjust these things early on than ones you've already grown a lot. The last point is one about uh, community health. Um, and here, I think this is informed both by experiences of people around me uh, and uh, my own experience, to be candid. Uh, as I mentioned, these are concerns that I've had uh, with some level of seriousness over the past months and years. Um, and the reason I mention this is that while I think uh, anyone can accept being in a, in a social movement or community that has a lot of flaws or, or weaknesses or things that need to be proven, uh, I, I can think of no community that doesn't have those. I think it is particularly difficult and particularly discouraging if you feel like no efforts are made to correct course. And the thing I want to emphasize with this particular point is that uh, in the absence of efforts to steer, I do think that there are people who will feel discouraged and ultimately sort of disengage from the community. Uh, on the other hand, there might be people who might not get involved even in the first place if they perceive it as a movement that has its eyes set on a particular goal and is very uninterested in uh, updating or reflecting on that goal. All right. Now, having introduced these three sort of very high-level uh, arguments for more steering, perhaps we can zoom in on one example activity that could fall under the umbrella of steering. And I'd like to present a sort of two-step approach to that. The first step is to what we could call navigate. That is to critically evaluate uh, what are we doing and is it what we should be doing and how can it be improved. And I think when we're talking about critiquing effective altruism, a lot of things get uh, sort of jumbled together because effective altruism is a lot of things. It's a philosophy, it's a, it's a social movement, it's a set of institutions, it's also a group of people. And so I'd like to provide a bit of a typology to separate these things out and give examples in each of these uh, categories. So I think effective altruism has a set of uh, philosophical foundations, uh, normative assumptions and moral values, each of which could be scrutinized and critiqued. There's a set of empirical assumptions or theories of change. How do we actually uh, make uh, things go differently in the world? What are the effects of certain causes and so on? Then there's a social movement which has not only concrete organizations, but also broader institutions. How is funding organized? How are decisions made? How transparent is everything? These, I think, we can call in a broad sense institutions that can be evaluated and improved upon. And then finally, it's not just a social movement, it is also a community, which again, I think, uh, has uh, norms and practices that perhaps can be evaluated and improved upon. So to take these in turn, on the right side, I have uh, some existing examples of great work in the, each of these categories. Uh, as mentioned, there are links to these in a forum post that I will show on the last slide. Uh, and on the left, just some uh, quick ideas, or uh, perhaps uh, not very descriptive, but sort of gestures towards ideas for things I'd like to see in, in each of these categories. In this particular domain, I think that my colleagues at the Global Priorities Institute uh, do a lot of great work on this already. One thing I really appreciate that they do is not just do the research themselves, but also try to create a broader research uh, agenda and community outside the effective altruism community uh, with researchers from dis different disciplines trying to scrutinize each of these normative assumptions. Then we have the empirical side of things. Effective altruism is also a set of beliefs around empirical things like how likely is extinction risk or what is the best way of reducing extinction risk. Um, I think two examples of good critiques, one from within the community and one perhaps more from the outside in this category, are one by 
that was given as a talk at EAG a couple of years ago uh, by Ben Garfinkel with the eloquently uh, chosen title, How Sure Are We About This AI Stuff? Critiquing some widely held beliefs about superintelligence uh, in the AI safety community. Uh, the second example I highlight here is a book review by the philosopher Amir Srinivasan of one of Will McCaskill's books, which I think challenges some of the uh, often implicit theories of change around uh, is the world changed better incrementally or more radically? And I think this kind of questioning is something I'd love to see more. I think one thing that's important to highlight in this category is because the effective ultimate community chooses very niche research questions that perhaps have not been investigated much, or at least not in a certain way before, it doesn't take that much to produce what might be the state of the art piece of research on that particular question. So if you're investigating a question like, how likely is it that humanity would recover from almost a near extinction? Or a question like, what is the probability that the future will be unbalanced good? Um, with a year's worth of research, perhaps, you can produce, um, if you're very motivated and, and diligent, a great piece of research that might be, the, it would be rational for others to defer to that piece of research as well. It's the best thing that's out there. However, even if in a relative sense this is better than anything else out there, in an absolute sense, these questions are so complex that I think it would be uh, mistaken to assume that, say, a year's worth of research uh, is enough to settle the question. And here I think it's really important to set up incentives so that when people are choosing you know, what questions to research, they're not looking at something saying, well, someone already solved that, so let's move on. Uh, and, and to pick another shinier, newer question, but also incentivize to scrutinize existing work and challenge it because the first pass, no matter the brilliance of the researcher, may not get it right. The third category is thinking about effective altruism as a social movement with certain organizations and institutions. I think some of these are uh, fairly self-explanatory, so uh, I will not go uh, too much in detail, but I think I'll make a general point that um, there's a lot probably to be learned from other social movements, institutions, whether that's political parties, things like the church, uh, other social movements that have a lot of experience with organizing. How do you set up the right incentives? How do you avoid corruption? How do you avoid nepotism? Uh, how do you have the right balance between efficiency and transparency? And so on. Finally, there is the fact that effective altruism is also very much a community. Um, and here, I often encounter a bit of hesitance about engaging this particular kind of critique because I think in part because, well, this is a wonderful community. Some of my best friends are in this community and many of them are at this conference today. And uh, I appreciate that, uh, that this is the case. But at the same time, I think the effective altruism community, even if it's a case that is constitutes, constituted by very motivated altruistic people, we're still liable and susceptible to all the challenges that any group of, uh, uh, of people, uh, socially organized community, would be. Um, so some of the things that I think in particular uh, are challenges with this community would be something around uh, how much do we defer to specific individuals? Uh, are we susceptible to groupthink? How much do we listen to people outside the community? Uh, how diverse is our approach to, to making the world better in terms of what uh, kinds of perspectives are represented? I think how demographically uh, diverse uh, is the community? I think this is something that the effective altruism community has struggled with for a long time. It's very homogenous and continues to struggle with. And with a lot of these things, um, maybe they're not uh, very new points, but we still haven't fully reckoned with their causes and effects and solutions. And so I'd like to see more work in that space. Um, all right, so I'd like to highlight, uh, I have a few minutes left, a couple of initiatives in this space. I'd be, I want to begin by emphasizing that, you know, in a sense, it's not entirely novel what I'm saying here. It is in the effective altruism tradition to scrutinize and, and raise objections, and I'd like to recognize that. Second, uh, and more recently, in fact, very recently, last week, uh, my colleagues, uh, Liska at the Center of Effective Altruism and Finn of the Future Humanity Institute, Institute and myself announced, or pre-announced as it were, that uh, we will announce at some point, hopefully, a prize for, we're working on the details after the announcement, but a uh, prize 
uh, for incentivizing critiques of each of these categories. Uh, so as <laughs> the young people say, watch this space. Um, <laughs> thirdly, uh, I'd like to give a shout out to the community health team, uh, who I think do tremendous uh, work on the latter two categories. I think uh, what I would love to see is in addition to uh, the wonderful work by, by especially these two individuals, I, I think it'd be good if the community had a so-called red team whose actual full-time job it was to think about some of these things. You know, I do biosecurity work from nine to five. I do, I think about this stuff on the margins of my day. Uh, one of my motivations for giving this talk is that like, I think it needs to be someone's job to, <laughs> to be doing this. Uh, in part because I don't have time and in part because you know, I might be wrong about each of my specific critiques. That's not the important point. The important point is that we have a movement where there are people who make it their job to, to look out for things to correct and then act on them. Um, the FTX Future Fund recently announced uh, a list of project ideas, um, one of which was they wanted to see critiques of their approach. Uh, I hope that I shouldn't read too much into the fact that this is at the bottom of a list of 36 ideas. <laughs> and, and this doesn't reflect the prioritization, but I was nevertheless uh, pleased to see it, and I hope that uh, if people are interested in work that could fall in this category, that they will seek out funding from the Future Fund. Finally, uh, this is something you can read more about online, but I just wanted to give a quick shout out to another recent initiative that was launched and is currently taking up applications, something called the Red Team Challenge. All right, so as I wrap up, um, I want to return to this two-step idea I alluded to. So you might think, well, Josh, that was a lot of initiatives. Um, haven't we already solved it? I think that all this great critique. And steering is not just navigation, it is also actually correcting course. And this is the second step, which I think is really crucial. And something I worry about, even by giving this talk, is it would create this impression that, well, the effective altruism community has this great tradition of critiques, <coughs> And you know, maybe there's even some prizes and some funding. Uh, you know, anyone who's saying that the effective altruism uh, community doesn't listen to critiques is just wrong. Um, but critiques are worth very little uh, in the absence of actions to actually correct course. And so I hope to see, and I, I, I choose to remain optimistic, that we don't just have people who say, yes, I'd love to see some critiques, but actually also have people who are willing to change things. Um, so I think we'll move on to questions now. If you want to uh, see any of the links that I referred to or even write a comment after the fact, uh, you can do that at this forum post. Um, I will also be hanging around afterwards, uh, perhaps going outside for a bit, if, if someone wants to have sort of a smaller informal conversation. Thank you very much for coming. I think we have time for maybe two questions. Uh, it's not quite two yet. So I'll give people a second to digest and raise their hand. I think we had some in the very back. Uh, yeah. I was wondering, um, uh, apart from the Jewish steering, what are your, your main things of the movement? Yeah. Um, <laughs> how much time do we have? <laughs> um, yeah, um, so I think I, I, there, were, there were some examples. I think um, on the, it depends, uh, on the empirical side of things, I think, uh, I guess again, I have this methodological critique of like a worry that uh, there is a lot of deference to uh, some analyses done by a few individuals that necessarily don't necessarily haven't received a lot of scrutiny. Um, and then a lot of just, well, this smart person said this, so let's just go with that. Um, I think, I don't wanna, I think it would take a long time <laughs> to, to go off. And I think the, the broader point here is that, you know, I might have some takes, but uh, more importantly, we just need a set of institutions that allow for course correction. Uh, so, uh, could you use this conference to solicit input from the broader community? Um, could you have more openness around this? There is this coordination forum, as it's called, uh, which occurs, I think, it seems to me in a very uh, opaque way that doesn't necessarily draw in a lot of input from people. Um, are there, and like, you know, some organizations have annual views where they look at mistakes made. Um, and I think I'd like to see more, both a norm, but also in concrete institutions to, to try to 
uh, draw on more and act on critiques from people. Um, yeah, doesn't directly answer the question, but I'm happy to talk more about it afterwards. Yeah. Thank you. I think we also had a question here. Yeah, I guess. So how do you mess a problem of like people too scared to put critiques that could actually affect their accommodating a job in the future? So like how do you kind of mitigate those kind of challenges? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think the 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 prize is is um, would be hopefully one element of creating a, a financial incentive. I would very much like to for there also be opportunities for sort of upfront funding where you don't have to do the whole piece of work and then potentially uh, get a um, a prize. I've been trying to work with the infrastructure fund. I think somewhat to my frustration, we haven't been able to uh, agree on on a setup yet, um, despite some. Uh, express interest from them. Um, so I think setting up financial incentives is, is definitely part of it. I think creating a culture where it is encouraged. Uh, this is part of what I want to do by giving this talk and sort of send a signal that there are, you know, to people in this room that there are others who think this way and so it's encouraged to sort of speak up. Um, so I think the, the, the financial incentives could perhaps have help. Um, I think socially creating a norm. Um, and I think also, again, Having people who's like who are dedicated to doing this as a full-time job would would help a lot uh, here. We had maybe one more question. Sure. Yeah. Um, most of these efforts seem to be directed towards members of the Epic Cultures community, like mm -hmm. participants in these efforts. Are are you aware of any other projects that work on getting people completely outside the Epic Cultures movement? Yeah. Yeah, uh, I think this would be great. I think uh, one related concern I have is that there's a lot of open-mindedness in the community if things are stated in very particular terms, written in a certain language, uh, and things are more likely to be dismissed if they're coming from outside the, the in-group. So this is very much something I'd be excited by. I think, as I mentioned, the Global Priorities Institute does this a little bit in their academic work. Um, uh, I would like to see when, whenever an effective altruism book is published, for instance, Will's new book, or books like The Precipice, that there's more an effort to say, okay, let's get subject matter experts on some of these topics to write reviews of specific chapters. Um, so that's something that I'd like to see more of. Um, but I do think that, uh, yeah, and I think it's also important to, to not say, oh, well, you know, it's up to the outside, to the critics who come to us. Uh, they might have, you know, very, uh, little incentives to actually engage with us uh, and I think maybe also not a feeling of being really heard or uh, because of aforementioned dismissiveness. So I think the onus is on us to seek out engagement from the outside world uh, and not just say, well, that's, if someone has something to say, they should say it. Um, yeah. So I'd like to see more in this space. Um, but does this exist? Um, I don't think there's that much of it. Like, I mean, I'm, I think it happens within uh, specific cause areas. So, um, yeah. Yeah. Um, I think we will probably, because people are sort of feeding out. Um, thank you so much for coming. And we can perhaps move outside for a small conversation afterwards. Um, thank you.